Good morning. So I'm Michelle. We are going to talk about the male sexual and reproductive health along with infertility this morning. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Miller to you guys. Um, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joel Miller. I am a retired obstetrician gynecologist who practiced my entire career once I finished my residency right here in Hickory. Um, I grew up in Statesville, North Carolina. I moved to Wake Forest at 18 for undergraduate school, stayed there for medical school, and I did an OBGYN residency at Wake Forest or Baptist Hospital or whatever name you want to use. It changed over the years. And then I came to Hickory and have been here ever since. Awesome. So we're going to start with the male sexual and reproductive health. Let's try to move my little picture away from the screen. <clears throat> so the introduction starts with um, talking about the uh, male anatomy and physiology and the overview of essential content for women's health care providers to provide um, care to males. So male and men are not meant to exclude transgender or those um, who wish to be known as non-binary people. So I think everybody knows the anatomy. I know you were also, Dr. Miller, involved in um, the immersion experience with some students, especially with PA whenever, and then we decided to do PA with the nurse practitioner program. I know when I went through it and we got the to experience these male models and doing, you know, a lot of those um, exams and the prostate exam and that kind of thing. Anything you want to add as far as um, the reproductive anatomy of the male? Well, not if everybody knows it. I mean, it's not real complicated. Uh, uh, female anatomy is more complicated, but that's the that's the uh, the view of a gynecologist. Right. So. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But if there's something you think needs clarified, I'm happy to speak to it. So. Absolutely. We'll keep moving forward. So you guys know all the structures. I feel confident. So you know about the scrotum. Um, it's the fibromuscular sac where the testes are suspended away from the body. The purpose is to maintain a temperature between one to two degrees Celsius lower than what our normal body temperature is for that spermatogenesis. Yes, if testicles are at normal body temperature, spermatogenesis uh, does not proceed normally. And so undescended testicles can certainly be a cause of infertility, but in today's world, that's usually picked up uh, in a child's early pediatric years and corrected, so. Exactly. So the testes, there's two functions, um, to produce sperm and to also produce testosterone. Um, so you can read some of these, some of these little bullet points, so to speak. So um, at 28 weeks gestation, they begin to descend into the scrotum. And then at 36 weeks, they enter that inguinal canal and then um, so on and so forth. Um, and then they move to the epididymis where they mature. So you guys can read that. The epididymis, crescent moon-shaped structure that rests on the posterior portion of each of the testicles. Um, 12 days travel time through the ducts. Sperm receives that nutrients and picks up testosterone allowing them to start to mature. And it's then stored in the epididymis, tail and vas deferens. Yeah. And the epididymis is an important part of the male reproductive exam. Uh, and most people will say, you know, I've never felt an epididymis, but it is not difficult to feel. It's on the posterior side of each testicle. Um, and it's soft and it's just a little raised area on the posterior part of, uh, of each testis. So. Okay. So then we get to the vas deferens, ejaculatory ducts, and the seminal vesicles. 
So the vas deferens are those tubes that extend from the epididymis in the scrotum through the pelvis to that ejaculatory duct. Um, stores and transports sperms into the urethra. And then where your seminal vesicles, there's two, they're single coiled, coiled tubes that secrete the majority of the seminal fluid. The seminal fluid then coagulates semen and may potentiate ca capacitation of the sperm in the female rep reproductive tract. So pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I do believe. You yeah, I do believe as well. Then we get to the penis, consists of the shaft and the glands. The glands are covered by that foreskin. And then we all know about circumcision where that foreskin is surgically removed. Um, so here's that. Penile tissue, there's three spongy cylinders, two paired corpus cavernosas and the corpus spongiosum. Um, anything there, function of is to um, expel sperm and to, of course, eliminate urine. Yeah, maybe one quick comment about the tunica albigenia. Okay. Uh, that's the fibrous sheath uh, around the uh, two corpora cavernosa, uh, and it is scarring in the tunica albigenia that leads to Peroni's disease. And everybody's seen the commercials now, so you're aware of Peroni's disease, I'm sure. But if there's scarring in that um, fibrous sheath, as the corpora cavernosa become engorged uh, to cause an erection, then uh, that scarred tissue in the tunica albigenia does not let it expand. And that's why you get the curving or the bending of the penis uh, that only appears uh, with an erection. Perfect, and I, I think that's something, of course, with the certification exam that we had to know about as well. So it's good. a good point. So then we get to the prostate. So it's a walnut-sized gland that weighs approximately 20 to 30 grams um, as a young adult. It's located between the bladder and the penis, and its function is to secrete fluid during ejaculation. So um, the fluid contains clotting enzymes and fibrinolysin that assist with sperm mobilization. Um, the growth and function is primarily controlled by testosterone. So um, anything you wanna add about the prostate? Well, not specifically about the prostate, but the whole process of, uh, of how semen coagulates. Okay. Uh, shortly after ejaculation, semen does coagulate, and then there are enzymes in the fluid that will cause that to liquefy uh, several minutes, even up to 30 minutes later. And uh, that liquefaction is what frees the spermatozoa uh, to act as heat-seeking missiles to find uh, a fertilizable ovum. Wow, that's a great point. Great point. So let's talk about the physiology, a reproductive physiology. So we talk about the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Uh, regulates reproductive development and functioning. Males um, is responsible for testosterone and sperm production. So there's a phenotypic development during embryogenesis and pubertal maturation. Came and talk. Relevant hormone is actually secreted by the hypothalamus every two hours. It's transported to that anterior pituitary gland through the portal vascular system and neuronal pathways. So you know about that system, that relay system, so to speak. And maybe one comment there, and this surprises most people, um, the hormones are exactly identical in males and females, in the hypothalamus, in the pituitary, and even at the testicular and ovarian level. Now, the levels of the two are dramatically different when it comes to the gonadal area. 
in that women have obviously much higher estrogen levels and have progesterone production, uh, but progesterone is only produced in any uh, measurable or realistically measurable amount after ovulation. Uh, but women also make testosterone in low levels. In men, testosterone levels obviously are much higher, but the male testicle will make low levels of estrogen also. So in truth, there is no difference in the types of hormones produced in males and females. It's just the levels are dramatically different. Great point, for sure. So there's um, spermatogenesis. It's the formation of sperm beginning at puberty and continuing throughout our adult life. Process takes approximately 64 days and it's controlled by intratesticular testosterone. Normal rate of sperm production is about 1200 sperm per second. It contains 46 chromosomes and divides into a, sperm, a germ cell and a primary spermatocyte. Yeah, it's really mind-boggling how many sperm yes, there are. It is, actually. Uh, when you look at a, uh, an average count of anywhere from 60 to 100 to 120 million sperm per milliliter of semen and know that the normal ejaculate is three to five uh, milliliters, uh, you know, that can be up toward a half billion sperm in an ejaculate. So. Unbelievable, actually, I think, when you talk numbers. You know, when you yep. try to break it down like that, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. So assessment, CDC and the United States Office of Population Affairs recommend services offered to men at a family planning visit. History taking, a physical examination, lab test, counseling should occur for males based on a comprehensive review of literature and expert opinion. So let's dig into the history. The five P's of sexual health, which are practices, partners, pregnancy prevention, protection from STIs and any past STI history. So those are important to obtain whenever you're gathering a history. And a couple comments here. This is a place where healthcare professionals in general do a very poor job. I agree. Uh, we are somewhat embarrassed to talk about sexual function. We are embarrassed to ask others about their sexual function, but it is an extremely important part of good general medical care. And so one of the things you need to do in your training is get over that hesitancy and embarrassment about asking people sexual questions. And if you display any signs of that embarrassment, you will find your patients will be hesitant to answer the questions honestly. So you need to be as calm and straightforward with questioning about sexual practices as you do with how much does your throat hurt or do you have a fever? It's just the same type of history taking. Yeah, I completely agree. And if you, if you have a good rapport with your patient and they know that you're genuinely asking these questions to help them, you know, you can get more out of them, right? Right. And especially when it comes to uh, sexual practices that we don't consider mainstream, those patients are going to be very hesitant to uh, confide in you if they perceive that you have problems with their sexual behavior. So true. So true. So we also need to make sure we're doing a thorough oral examination, look at those STI infections that it can affect the lips or the gums, tongue and pharynx. The genital examination, it says, can be done with patient in supine or standing position. 
Um, looking for hernias, variceals that could be checked in that standing position as well. A good visual inspection is so important. Look at the pubic hair distribution, that scrotal skin, and size of testes and penis. So don't be afraid, right? Exactly. I mean, you, you don't act embarrassed right. when you examine a patient's genitalia, whether it's the same uh, gender as you or the opposite gender. Because you're you're there for the patient, so you're doing what's you know you're doing a thorough exam, and they're going to appreciate you for that. It's it's just as a normal part of an exam as looking in their pharynx. Exactly. So to continue, palpate the growing bilaterally and check for any enlarged lymph nodes. Examination of the penis begins with the inspection of the shaft skin, the previous and glands. I was totally didn't say that right. You did. You came close. The papoose is just Perpuse. foreskin. So. Okay. so then an anal and rectal examination. You need to always inspect the anal area. Um, examine the prostate. You guys all should know how to do this exam because you've gotten to do it on live models, um, which was an excellent experience. Um, so I don't probably don't need to reiterate that. Anything you want to add about the prostate exam? Just don't be ashamed to do it. Uh, healthcare providers try to avoid uh, genital exams in general, but particularly try to avoid rectal exams. Uh, it's the only way you can feel the prostate. Uh, and in women, it's the only way you can feel the posterior part of a woman's pelvis. And so you should not apologize if there is a need for a rectal exam, if you do one. So laboratory tested, um, of course, we, we know that it's guided by patients' risk factors, any history, and physical examination. Um, tests to consider during the visit could be um, some STIs like chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas, syphilis, HIV, you've got hep B and C, and even a diabetic screening. Is there anything else you think that we're missing there? Well, unless there's something else that they present the problem another, yeah. that you're encountering <laughs> right. specifically right. demands. Exactly. So we're going to go through some STIs for, for the males. I know we did females last week, but um, I want to hit some male STIs. So it can vary, of course, between males and females. Um, it says discrepancies include health skin behavior dis, um, differences, the anatom anatomical differences, I can't speak today, that increase or decrease susceptibility, sexual behavioral different, differences, and other factors. And there's some STIs that it says to consider. So that's chlamydia, gonorrhea, non-gonococcal urethritis, urethritis, that's what it right? Epididymitis, syphilis, and HPV. And I added one on my list that I oh, think needs to be on everybody's let list. Let me hear. And that's herpes simplex. Oh, yes. HSV is extremely common in males and females. Um, and so you need to be aware of the uh, symptoms and signs of HSV infection and the differences between primary infections and recurrent infections. Uh, and so look for any ulcerative lesions or other uh hsv signs yeah we talked last week you guys probably remember um when we had um terry in here talking about a female hsv um that how it is common to get um hsv one on the female genitalia but due to oral sex we were kind of talking about that yeah everybody used to say hsv one was above the waist and hsv two was below the waist yeah. Uh, there, there is no way that there is such a demarcation. That's right. Uh, one and two both live above the waist and below the waist. Yep. And from an exam, you can't tell the difference. Right. That's a, a um, laboratory differentiation. That's so. exactly right. So just so you know, there's no difference here as well. Right. Okay, good. I'm glad you added that. 
So let's talk about chlamydia, most common reportable STI in the United States. Um, symptoms would include dysuria, urinary frequency, clear, cloudy, or mucopurulent mucoid urethral discharge. Um, you've got that urethral or meatal itching, tingling, discomfort, can also cause epididymitis, prostate, prostatitis, and proctitis. I'm butchering all these. Tons. Yeah. And, and males tend to be more symptomatic with chlamydia. Females have a higher rate of asymptomatic chlamydia. Uh, one of the my favorite things to tell students is that if you want to be a successful STI organism, have a large percentage of your victims who are asymptomatic and you will perpetuate yourself. Oh, wow. Good point. So let's talk about gonorrhea. This one's the second most commonly reported STI in the United States. So you see some of the same symptoms. You still have that dysuria, but now we have copious mucopurulent urethral discharge. You start seeing swelling of that distal shaft and glands. And there again, it can also cause epididymitis, prostatitis, orchitis, seminal vesticulitis, and infections of the Tyson and bulbourethral glands. And with um, orchitis, which is an infection of the testicle or epididymitis, you can have a very uncomfortable and at times even sick patient uh, with a lot of pain, a lot of uh, swelling, and even systemic symptoms like fever. Oh, wow. <clears throat> that makes sense. Then we move on to non-gonococcal urethritis, um, a cluster of symptoms and signs associated with more of like an inflammation of the urethra from infections or non-infectious causes. Those symptoms would be like urethral discharge, dysuria, the urethral itching and discomfort. And just to add something there, clinically, <clears throat> you really cannot tell whether you're dealing with chlamydia, uh, gonorrhea or non-gonococcal urethritis, which is often from mycoplasma. That is again, a laboratory diagnosis. The symptoms tend and signs uh, tend to be very similar. Good point. So then we head into epididymitis and the symptoms would include you know, unilateral testicular pain and tenderness, a hydrocele and um, swelling. And it can be bilateral, but it often is unilateral. So. Okay. And there's syphilis. This is also common in males. Higher risk patients are men who have sex with other men, those who are HIV positive and those who have a partner with syphilis. And one thing to add there, primary syphilis where a chancre occurs is often asymptomatic, more so in females because it may well be internal and never seen. Uh, on males, it is more likely to be visible because of the differences in anatomy. But since it is not painful, many of these uh, patients never seek any, um, uh, any care. So. There you go. HPV, this is a very common STI in the United States, estimated to infect up to 80% of sexually active men and women. And in some studies, it's even as much as 85%. Wow. And the, um, the real take home here is the fact that HPV is now conclusively proven to be the etiologic agent for genital malignancies of many types, mainly cervical, but penile carcinomas, uh, anal carcinomas, uh, vulvar carcinomas uh, are HPV related. And we have a vaccine 
and healthcare workers in general do a very poor job getting people vaccinated. And uh, adolescents are the ones who should be vaccinated. Uh, gynecologists do a pretty good job at that. Some pediatricians do, but many pediatricians, because of the hesitancy to discuss sexual functioning, mm -hmm. Uh, really don't do a very good job getting adolescents vaccinated against HPV. I agree with that. <clears throat> I know we have one student who is um, has her project surrounded by Gardasil. So I'm really interested to see how that quality improvement project um, plays out. So I love it. Great. Yep. So then we get to male sexual dysfunction. It could be lifelong or um, acquired, talking about premature ejaculation. It's an ejaculation that occurs nearly or always prior to or without a minute of vaginal penetration. <clears throat> they have the inability to delay that ejaculation on all or nearly all vaginal penetrations. Um, there's negative personal consequences such as distress, um, bother, frustration, and or the avoidance of sexual intimacy at all. So, and with lots of sexual dysfunction and premature ejaculation is certainly one of the ones where this is true, the more anxious a patient becomes about the dysfunction, the worse the dysfunction is likely to be. So. Yeah. The erectile dysfunction, it's the consistent or recurrent inability to attain and or maintain an erection sufficient for sexual satisfaction. And that is age associated, not completely, but as males uh, age, their rate of erectile dysfunction increases. Right. So let's dig into contraception, talking about a vasectomy, um, high effective and safe method for permanent contraception. It's 0.15% pregnancy rate in the first year after the procedure. There's rarely any complication. 11% of married couples use vasectomy as their preferred method for contraception, um, which I find relatively low. I think, I don't know, do you think? It seems kind of low I, when you put I a think, number up there. Again, I was a gynecologist. Right, <laughs> right. But I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Uh, males are different creatures when it comes to contraception. They think it's uh, the female's uh, responsibility. And lots <clears throat> of males have a lot of misconceptions, although I guess that's a bad term to use, but misconceptions about what vasectomies do and how it's going to change them. And the answer is the only thing that's going to change is their inability to have their partner conceive. Um, it's a fairly simple procedure that's done just through a very small incision uh, on each side of the scrotum and you find the vas deferens and it is ligated. Uh, the biggest reason for failures is when people do not come back for their follow-up uh, semen analyses. The way you know it's successful is you examine semen specimens after the procedure. Uh, this is the vas deferens is upstream in the male reproductive system. So it takes a while for all the sperm that are in the rest of the vas deferens and the seminal vesicles and so forth uh, to be gone. And so uh, men are told to follow up and have semen specimens checked until they're free of spermatozoa. And if they don't, that's the biggest reason to have failures. Right, right. It's a pretty, I got to actually see this be done and it seemed relatively, as long as the patient's still, you know, seemed relatively um, simple procedure, honestly. It is. I mean, there can be complications. Right, we right. can rarely have bleeding, uh, have a, a scrotum that fills up with blood, but uh, and infection is a complication with any surgery. But the the complication rates are extremely low right. with vasectomy. 
Right. And they said they actually made the comment that it was like um, they would have to ejaculate at least 30 times. They, they had preferred that before the patient brought back a specimen. To, to, that's kind of like the number that they use. I'm yeah, not, most not most sure. urologists don't give you a scorecard and I say, know, right? yeah, they, they, just, they, they say yeah. come back at X time yeah. Yeah. And, and you you keep returning until the specimen yeah. is free of spermatozoa. So. Yeah, so I found that interesting. So I'm like, wow, okay. So let's jump into testicular cancer. It's most common among males between the ages of 20 to 40. It accounts for approximately one to two percent of all cancers of the male population group in the United States. Ninety-five percent have been found to be germ cell tumors, and five percent are caused by sex cord stromal tumors. The five-year survival rate is ninety-nine percent for that localized disease, and um, it drops down to seventy-five when they find that it has metastasized. But even with metastatic disease, cure rates are still very good. Uh, chemotherapy is very effective against uh, particularly germ cell testicular tumors. And so uh, the, the cure rates um, have increased dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years. So. That's great. And you see the risk factor down there, that cryptocortism family or personal history, and the intratubular germ cell neoplasia. Yeah, and cryptorchidism is simply on the of the testicles, right. if you don't know that term. So. so how do these patients present? They, um, the majority present with a painless testicular mass. Um, after trauma to the testicles, person can notice a mass while doing a self-examination secondary to the injury. Pain can start occurring if the tumor is growing rapidly or has actually caused an intratesticular hemorrhage. Yeah, and when you educate patients, and generally with males, you don't have to tell them to touch their testicles. They do it all the time. But uh, tell them when they're in the shower, feel their testicles uh, and do this occasionally just to, uh, to see- It's kind of like a breast exam. You know, yeah. they tell us to do breast exam as women. So, you know, why wouldn't men, you know? So assessment, any mass should be assumed to be cancer until proven otherwise. If it's found, the provider should do a thorough examination of both testicles comparison, right? And then maybe even an ultrasound um, is, should be required for any suspicious mass. Yeah, and there's usually a little difference in the size of the two testicles, but it's not dramatic. And so if there's any significant difference, and if a mass is uh, non-tender, it has a very high suspicion for a testicular malignancy. Yeah. Management initial treatment is um, radical inguinal orchiectomy with removal of the testicle and spermatic cord to the level of the inguinal ring. And of course, always early detection and treatment is essential because tumors can have rapid growth rates. So. Yes, you can have uh, a testicular malignancy that gets as big as a grapefruit in a hurry, so. Wow. Gay and bisexual men's health. I know we've kind of already kind of touched base on this a little bit in one of our other lectures, um, but we're gonna hit on it here as well because it's in this chapter. Healthcare access and experience. There is a lack of access to quality, affordable and appropriate care effects. Um, the health status of many gay and bisexual men. So many gay and bisexual men are more likely to delay or not receive healthcare due to cost or trouble finding their provider. 8% of this population report that a clinician refused to provide care to the patient due to their sexual orientation. And 9% had providers use harsh or abusive language. And again, like we said before, here is where your attitude as a provider and the uh, both verbal and nonverbal keys that you display to a patient are extremely important uh, in how you care for these people. 
if you uh, either verbally or non-verbally um, display negative feelings, uh, you will have a patient that will not confide in you. That's a shame, really. All right. They have higher rates, of course, on the last slide, increased number of health condition and adverse behaviors, higher rates of cigarette smoking, substance abuse, depression, anxiety, attempted and completed suicides, HIV and um, STIs. And adolescent gay individuals have much higher suicide, well, that's in there, suicide rates. Yeah, that's... yeah. unfortunately. So then there's HIV and syphilis. Um, gay and bisexual men are disproportionately affected by HIV and syphilis. 4.5% um, in the United States accounted for 70% of those new HIV infections, 68% new syphilis infections back in 2017. Um, one in six gay and bisexual men are infected with HIV, are not aware of their infection. Having, a, having syphilis actually puts a person at a higher risk of contracting HIV. So, <clears throat> disheartening statistics there. All right, so that ends that lecture. When I find my mouse, we're going to stop that one <laughs> and go into our next lecture of infertility. So we're going to jump on in and complete these lectures for this week. So let's talk about the scope of infertility. It's the failure to achieve pregnancy after 12 months or more, so a whole con concurrent year um, of regular unprotected intercourse. So primary infertility, if the patient has never been pregnant before, secondary is the in inability to become pregnant or carry pregnancy to term following the birth of one or more biological children. And of course, women older than the age of 35, an evaluation and treatment is considered after six months of attempting pregnancy. And maybe one thing to add there, even in women younger than 35, if the patient has significant symptoms that point to a cause of her infertility, uh, you may want to begin an evaluation earlier. A good example would be a woman who has developed significant secondary dysmenorrhea, uh, a common sign of endometriosis. Uh, you should probably begin her evaluation much earlier than six months. Uh, the or much earlier than a year, certainly. Oh, yeah. uh, certainly women with endometriosis can conceive. Uh, it is a source of infertility, but uh, just because you think a patient might have endometriosis doesn't mean you don't give her a few cycles to see if she can conceive. Uh, most of us figure that if we're normal, we conceive in one cycle. And that's not true. There's a statistic called fecundity, which is the mathematical chance of achieving pregnancy in one cycle of normal sexual behavior. And that in studies is anywhere in the 22, 23% range is all. Wow. So let's talk about the anatomy and physiology of the reproductive um, related to infertility. So there's fertilization, also known as conception and implantation. So we know that the sperm is produced, it's deposited in the vagina, transported through the vagina to the cervix, to the fallopian tubes. We have capacitation, which is the sperm's ability to actually fertilize the egg. Ovaries produce mature ovum, ovum transported from the ovary to the fallopian tube, fertilized by the sperm, travels down the fallopian tube to the uterus. And then we have implantation where the fertilized ovum attaches to that uterine wall. And one thing that surprises most people is that implantation doesn't occur until about seven days after fertilization. So fertilization occurs in the 
ampullary portion of the fallopian tube. And it takes that long for that fertilized ovum to migrate down the tube and implant the uterus. Wow. Yeah, that is interesting for sure. So pathophysiology and etiology, 55% of infertility cases um, are due to female factors, whereas 35% are due to male factors. Eight to 28% in couples, depending on age, um, where there's no cause to be found. Female infertility, usually due to ovulatory dysfunction and tubal and peritoneal um, pathology. So they could have like an ovulatory dysfunction where there's total lack of ovulation or irregular ovulation, so to speak, or even a tubal problem where there's blockages within that tube. Yeah, and a very important corollary there. As the human species has become more and more obese, the uh, percentages of ovulatory dysfunction or lack of ovulation increases significantly. Wow much more common for obese women to be anovulatory. I mean, whenever you have a patient that comes in who's infertile do you, and they're obese, do you say, have you tried losing weight? Is that a conversation that you have? Well, of course, that's okay. a conversation if she's not trying to get pregnant, but it, uh, is a, it isn't always very effective, oh, yeah. as I'm sure you know. Oh, of course, of course. Certainly. But, but yes, uh, anovulatory women, if you can get them to lose weight, they will often ovulate spontaneously, especially if, if you get a history that they had regular cycles when they were thinner. So, That's good to know, see? Yep. Pearls of wisdom right there. So we have ovulatory dysfunction from any interruption of that hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Tubal diseases are blockages from pelvic inflammatory disease or even STIs. And then there's that endometriosis, which you've already kind of discussed, and Asherman syndrome, fibroids, chronic endometritis. Yeah, very few people know what Asherman syndrome is, right. but that's scarring in the endometrial cavity. Adhesions are scarring. Uh, it can come from infections, but that doesn't happen very often. Uh, it's really a fairly uncommon uh, problem but it can occur from an over vigorous dilatation and curatage surgical procedure DNC. Uh, yeah, that's good tonight. So then we hop on into the male infertility. Uh, it could be idiopathic, primary gonadal disorders, sperm transport disorders, and of course we have to throw in there that hypothalamic pituitary disorder. Um, gonadal failure, there's um, cro chromosomal disorders, those undescended testes, varicels, infections, medications, radiation, environmental exposures, and of course, chronic illnesses. Yeah, and, and most males with um, chromosomal disorders have other stigmata that have been picked up usually in their uh, childhood health care but you still occasionally see an adult male who has a chromosomal disorder that wasn't diagnosed. Uh, a lot of these men, when you do their uh, genital exams, will have uh, underdeveloped or small testicles. So one of the, one of the hints. Oh, wow. Good to know. Then we can uh, talk about combined causes the inability of the sperm to survive and um, the woman's cervical mucosa, um, presence of anti-sperm antibodies. Simultaneous causes that together increased risk of infertility and sexual dysfunctions. Yeah, the, uh, the antibody problem in cervical mucus is really poorly understood. And uh, it's probably pretty rare but it is something that you'll see mentioned and it can be a, a problem. Um, so. Psychological distress. And then there's that unexplained infertility where um, we can't find the specific cause, unfortunately. Yep, a very common problem, but we have very good treatments for that now. Uh, 
you know, IVF uh, in vitro fertilization is used for a lot of these different factors now because it's become much more successful and is not the, the huge barrier that it used to be, although the cost is still a very big barrier for some people and many insurance plans do not cover infertility treatment and especially the expense of IVF. Yeah. So the assessment of infertility includes a history. So of course, always an accurate and detailed history from patient and even their partner. The physical examination of the woman, you do a complete physical and pelvic examination, male, same, complete physical and reproductive history. Diagnostic procedures include ovulation detection and semen analysis. And the most common way to detect ovulation now is to measure a luteal phase progesterone. Progesterone is extremely low prior to ovulation. But once ovulation occurs, um, testosterone rises and that luteal phase is a very reliable 13, 14 or 15 days. And so if you collect a progesterone level on about day 21 in a woman with uh, average 28 day cycles, there's a certain normal level that, that you should get and that proves ovulation has occurred. Perfect. So um, detect, how do you detect ovulation? You can record those basal body temperatures each day um, as soon as the patient awakes. They always say, as soon as you open your eyes, grab the thermometer, take the temperature, um, and it says OTC urine test to, to look for that luteinizing hormone, right? Right. Although. Neither of those are much of a part of an infertility evaluation now. Uh, almost everybody measures progesterone. It's much simpler and much less prone to error than basal body temperatures. Very few people do it uh, compulsively enough to make it worthwhile. Uh, the the over-the-counter test for LH surge uh, is used most often today simply to time ovulation for procedures such as uh, intrauterine inseminations and so forth. So neither of those two are used very commonly to just prove ovulation. Right. Male infertility is detected with the semen analysis. Um, we can do tests like blood samples, hyster, hystero, south, Venogram. Hysterosalpingogram. It, it is simply placing a cannula into the cervix and filling the endometrial cavity with radio opaque dye and watching it fill the endometrial cavity, course out the fallopian tubes and spill into the perineal cavity. That's a hysterosalpingogram. Trying to see if there's any blockages like what they talked about before, sure. if that makes sense. Yep. We can do a transvaginal ultrasound. And the other thing that a hysterosalpingogram will tell you is the shape and size of the endometrial cavity and whether there are things like, we mentioned Asherman syndrome, scarring in that endometrial cavity, abnormal shapes of the endometrial cavity that are fairly common or uh, the presence of uh, masses in the endometrial cavity, such as lyomyomata fibroids. So, Perfect. Uh, hysteroscopies and lapar laparoscopies. Yeah, hysteroscopy is placing a fiber optic visual instrument into the endometrial cavity through the cervix. It can be done diagnostically. It can also be used therapeutically to resect things such as polyps and uh, fibroids that bulge into the endometrial cavity. And then laparoscopy is where you place uh, a fiber optic um, scope 
into the abdominal cavity, usually through a subumbilical incision, but it can be placed other areas too. And you use that to inspect the pelvic organs or it has tremendous therapeutic uses also with tremendous amounts of surgical procedures that can be done laparoscopically now. Perfect. Not routinely recommended, however, is those postcoital tests, endometrial biopsies, and sperm penetration assays. Yeah, and the three of those are done rarely in today's world. Right. Prevention or management of infertility. Of course, we need to do a diagnosis, treatment, prevention, treatments um, specific to calls, patient education, ovulation um, induction, with um, clomiphene, citrate, and letrozole. Yeah, the, those are two drugs that are used to induce ovulation. They work through a little different mechanism. Um, so, and we probably don't need to get into the weeds of exactly how they work, but they feed back at the hypothalamic pituitary level and increase, um, gonadotropin release uh, and can induce ovulation through that mechanism. Okay. Pregnancy is achieved with intrauterine insemination, in vitro fertilization, and in intracytoplasmic sperm e injections. And you've kind of touched base on IVF a little bit. Yeah, um, IVF um, is the test tube baby bit. Uh, it's interesting that that first occurred, I think, in 1978, which is not that long ago when you think about it. Nice. First done, done in Britain. Um, Louise Brown was the patient born. It's amazing that I can remember that. I'm like sitting here <laughs> saying, oh my gosh, I'm so impressed right now. <laughs> yep. And a doctor named Steptoe, and there was another one were the first two guys that pulled this off. Wow. Um, uh, I've got to go grab that article. Yeah. Um, intrauterine insemination is where, and, and it's used for different problems. It can even be used for idiopathic infertility. It's where you are really trying to simply put the sperm closer to their target. Uh, I have heard it said that when sperm are present in the vagina and are trying to reach uh, an ovum in the ampullary portion of the fallopian tube, it's uh, analogous to jumping in the uh, ocean at Myrtle Beach and swimming to France. Oh, that's so a it's, good point. So it's darn amazing that it happens as predictably as it does. So with intrauterine insemination, we simply take an ejaculate, a sperm specimen. It is processed in the lab to, to try to remove as much as, of the seminal plasma or seminal fluid as possible and resuspend the, somat the spermatozoa in a nutrient chemical solution. That solution is then with the spermatozoa present is placed through a cannula into the endometrial cavity in order to uh, bypass the cervix and get the spermatozoa closer to where they're headed. Intracytoplasmic sperm injection is amazing procedure. This is where a single or two sperm can be placed into an ovum microscopically with a micro pipette. They literally aspirate a sperm or two into this micro pipette, use that micro pipette to uh, puncture the cytoplasm uh, of an oocyte and uh, place the sperm there. Wow. Unreal. There's a treatment of short luteal phase. Um, normalized prolactin level may lengthen that luteal phase um, and treatment can be ambiguous. 
yeah, um, th this is sort of a nebulous area, but there are people who have low progesterone levels after ovulation. They often have a shorter luteal phase instead of that 14 day luteal phase that's about average. It may be 10 or 11 days and some of them are infertile. And some people treat that with progesterone supplementation, usually with vaginal progesterone suppositories, but other uh, progesterone supp supplementation can be used. Or some people will treat this with the same medications that you use for ovulation induction, with the idea being you have a healthier follicle that is produced prior to ovulation, and thus you have a healthier corpus luteum from that follicle after ovulation has occurred. So both of those methods are used to treat uh, luteal phase defects. Wow. So treatment for male factor infertility actually um, depends on this specific problem. So options for women and men with infertility is the assisted reproductive technology. So the IVF, of course, we talked is the most widely used. You have the gam gamete intrafallopian transfer. Which is taking a fertilized egg and placing that after fertilization into the fallopian tube. This is not done very much. Uh, IVF itself is done much more commonly. And with that, either the gamete or the zygote, zygote is placed transcervically into the endometrial cavity. Uh, getting it into the fallopian tube involves a more invasive procedure, usually laparoscopy. So GIFT is not used very often. IVF is used much more commonly. What about the intracytoplasmic sperm injection? That's the, what we just talked about mm -hmm. with that micropipette that injects uh, spermatozoan into an oocyte. So you think, so IVF over that one, I, I don't know what kind of order you'd actually put them in and what's used, I guess, whatever's needed. Yeah, um, uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection uh, is gonna lead to embryo transfer into the nice. uterus. So the, the, after the intracytoplasmic sperm injection is done, you'll take those uh, whatever fertilized uh, uh, zygotes you get or uh, gametes you get uh, and put them into the endometrial cavity after fertilization has occurred. So it's not gametes, that's before fertilization. So. so this is where they actually say how many they want placed inside, depending on how many, you know, remember how they say, well, we went ahead and did two. Well, but that's a factor with IVF okay. or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Uh, yeah, uh, and most competent reproductive clinics now will only put two uh, embryos uh, in the uterus in a transfer. Okay. And that's because triplets and quadruplets have a much higher failure rate yeah. with prematurity and pregnancy loss. So almost all IVF clinics now are limiting embryo transfer to two embryos. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah I was curious. So there could also be a collaborative or third party reproduction where the person who will not be raising the child, sperm or egg donor or surrogate mother, so to speak. Yeah, egg donation, sperm donation uh, is, is really very, very common. Uh, and surrogacy is, is more common than most people would ever guess. So. Wow. And then of course, we cannot forget about adoption. So. so evidence for best practices related to infertility care um, comes, through, I guess, through us um, ART guidelines, practice committee of the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, and practice committee of the ASRM. Yeah. 
SART is the uh, professional organization for reproductive endocrinologists that almost all uh, reproductive endocrinologists is going to belong to. And they have very strict guidelines. They keep very good statistics on uh, IVF clinics, for example, and success rates. And those are available online so that patients can evaluate a, a clinic success rates before um, they become involved with a, a reproductive clinic. Yeah, that's important for sure. Psychological issues related to that infertility. I know people do suffer from, from feeling like they, they're incapable of getting pregnant. Yeah, and, and the stresses on a partnership are huge. A very high, surprisingly high number of um, infertile couples have relationship problems, divorces occur as a result of infertility, and many quality reproductive endocrinology clinics require patients to undergo uh, couple counseling. I was getting ready to talk about that because yeah. I think that that is so important that, you know, when you're, when you're taking on a couple who are, who are, you know, intimately trying to conceive and, and share a child together, you know, you have to think about the whole aspect of care, like a holistic kind of partnership care with counseling. Infertility is directly intertwined with the family. Um, and social issues vary in different societies and different socioeconomic groups. Yep, in, in, um, in some uh, social groups, some family groups, some ethnic groups, infertility is a tremendous stigma. For sure. So special considerations, people who survive cancer may want to also conceive um, options for women at the end of childbearing years. Um, there's patient counseling treatment for infertility involves more than, than just the physical treatment itself, which we kind of just discussed. Yeah, very common thing now is that women who are going to undergo um, significant chemotherapy, bone marrow transplants, and things such as that, will be offered the opportunity to collect and freeze oocytes prior to their treatment because uh, some of those treatments are cytotoxic to uh, gonadal tissue, in other words, ovaries for those women. And the same thing can be done with men before they undergo significant um, malignancy treatment like that. Uh, for women at the end of their childbearing years, uh, when your ovaries are out of eggs, they are out of eggs and there will not be any more. But that's where oocyte donation can be used. And women, I don't know what the current record is now for uh, the oldest woman to conceive and deliver a baby, but it's in the 70s. So. Really? Yes. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yes. To me, something today, guys, just so you know. So there's, of course, there's ethical issues um, we all need to be aware of and mindful of is the expense of infertility treatment, um, ability to conceive with technology, how real parent, of course, is defined, and multiple embryos. So. That gets, again, back to the IVF uh, embryo transfer business. And it used to be in the days where conception rates with IVF were lower, they would put four or five embryos if they had them back in the uterus. And uh, the hope was you'll get one or two that implant. The nightmare is you get four or five that implant. And if you take a couple that lose a pregnancy at 18 weeks, because it's a quintuplet pregnancy, they have no babies. And so they have gone through uh, a lot of misery with no results. And so, like we said a little bit ago, most infertility 
uh, IVF clinics are now limiting embryo transfer to two. Our success rate with twins, if they occur, is very high. Uh, success rates with quadruplets or quintuplets is extremely low. Right. Well, that ends our lectures for this week. I want to um, personally thank Dr. Miller for coming in to talk to us about these two topics. Um, his expertise is very much appreciated, I know, by myself and, of course, you guys as well. And, um, and I'm going to throw this in there um, for our immersion coming up in April. I have asked Dr. Miller, and he is so graciously accepted. I'm not going to allow him to back out, just so you guys know. So you are all witnesses. that He's going to be there with us, and we are so excited to have his support and him being on board with us and our program. So thank you all for listening, and um, we will touch base this week.